Hi, I'm Bill Crystal. Welcome back to Conversations. I'm very pleased to have with me again today Larry Summers, President Emeritus and University Professor at, here at Harvard. Uh, we're doing this here at, right near Harvard. Um, what's going on? What's going on at Harvard? What's going on in higher ed? Someone like me who has uh, attachment to Harvard and uh, respect for American higher education, but a little bit appalled by the last few months, but maybe I'm, maybe I'm wrong or missing something or tell me. Look, Bill, the, the main thing that's happening is what always happens. S professors teach courses, students take courses, <laughs> students aspire to graduate, they make friends, they plan their lives, they have a formative experience, they are educated, and anybody who thinks that that's not the main thing going on on college campuses is making a mistake. That said, I feel better. <laughs> I feel better. <laughs> that, yeah. That 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 said, uh, it seems to me whether it's the president of Princeton negotiating with people as they took over his office on the name of schools at uh, Princeton, whether it is uh, the kind of attacks on very reasonable free speech having to do with adults' right to choose their own Halloween costumes at Yale, whether it's the administration using placemats in the di dining hall to propagandize about what messages students should give their parents about Syrian refugee policy uh, when they uh, come home. There is a great deal of absurd political correctness. Now, I'm somebody who believes very strongly in uh, diversity, who resists uh, racism in all of its many uh, incarnations, who think that there's a great deal that's unjust in American society that needs to be combated. But it seems to me that there is a kind of um, creeping totalitarianism uh, in terms of what kind of ideas are acceptable and are debatable on uh, college campuses. And I think that's hugely unfortunate. I think the answer to bad speech is different speech. The answer to bad speech is not uh, shutting down uh, speech whether it's uh, climate deniers, and I yield to no one in my degree of confidence that the scientific evidence points to uh, overwhelming evidence that there is a serious global climate change uh, problem. But atmospheric scientists who disagree with that conclusion should be able uh, to have their say. I was proud to write a brief as president of Harvard in support of affirmative action. And I think that's the right position and I hope the Supreme Court will uphold it. But those who feel differently should be able to have uh, their uh, say. And the idea that, for example, as took place in recent years, um, a serious suggestion is put forward that the law of rape not be covered at Harvard Law School because it would be a painful experience for some law students is one that it seems to me administrators should be denouncing rather than uh, sympathizing uh, with. Uh, the idea that somehow uh, microaggressions in the form of a racist statement contained in a novel should be treated in parallel with violence right. or actual sexual assault seems to me to be uh, crazy. And I worry very much that if our Acad leading academic institutions become places that uh, prize comfort over truth, 
that prize the pursuit of mutual understanding over the pursuit of better and more accurate uh, understanding that a great deal will be lost. Lost in terms of the education of students, lost in terms of a model for society based on the authority of ideas rather than the idea of authority, and based on what will be lost if uh, what's comfortable is prized over what's uncomfortable because what history, the history of ideas, if anything, uh, teaches that uh, the greatest progress almost always involves ideas that are initially hugely uncomfortable for the existing order. And liberal education is always about making people uncomfortable liberal in one way or another. Socrates made people uncomfortable. If liberal right? education <laughs> doesn't, I, I would go so far as to say that if you come home after your freshman year in college with no fundamental preconception that you had shaken, right. your freshman year in college has not been a success. And that, and so the whole idea of privileging uh, comfort uh, seems, to, seems to me to be a very dangerous uh, one but it is one that is uh, increasingly uh, fashionable on uh, campuses. Yeah, no, I've, I've been struck by that. And also, I'd, I, I think you'd also agree that if all your professors are moving to simply replace one set of preconceived ideas with another, that's not the point either. You'd want challenges to conceptions among your professors and among your you know, students I had the, and on campus. And you know, I had the, that's not I had a good thing. I had the experience uh, some years ago of uh, attending a commencement ceremony at a different university, uh, not Harvard, where I was fortunate enough to be receiving an honorary degree. And the president of that university gave a very powerful uh, commencement address, but at one point uh, said, here at this university, we consider every argument, analyze every question, process every bit of data, ponder every text, engage in intense conversation on every subject. And out of that comes, and I waited, and I expected the answer to be something like, a closer approximation to the truth we will never find, or a better understanding of the world. And instead, what I heard was a better understanding of each other's position. <laughs> and that idea, that privileged, the equal respectability of all positions, the idea that there wasn't a way of making progress through debate, but all that came was a greater understanding of each other's position seemed to me to deny the basic methods and modes of thought that had driven so much uh, progress over the last 200 years, whether it was scientific progress that enables us to live the way we live uh, today, or whether it was progress with respect to ideas that's led to uh, the very different way that women live relative to uh, men uh, compared to what was the case a uh, hundred years ago. So the, that idea that there was no such thing as changing one's position right. in the face of being, able, being unable to defend it uh, in a compelling way that seemed to me so antithetical to what should be academic values, but at the same time, it seemed to all of those around me to be so much a commonplace that I think there is uh, a serious epistemic challenge 
in terms of the modes of thought that prevail in many parts of uh, university communities. And what do you think happened? I mean, I, as I agree, I sort of went from, I'd say, among conservatives, I probably was one of those somewhat minimizing, I made fun of political correctness and thought it was a bad thing, and unfortunate for students who had to put up with it, but didn't think it was really a serious threat to freedom of inquiry, freedom of speech, even freedom of thought to some degree for the undergraduates especially. It's one thing if you're already a faculty, tenured faculty, you can keep your thoughts to yourself if it's too painful to, to get too much uh, pressure if you say something, but you, know, you, you won't stop thinking. But if you're 19 years old, if you're sort of told certain things are out of bounds, you may not even inquire in the first place and you won't learn the arguments against your own position, you might not change your mind, or you might not understand your own position better. I mean, Mill makes that point in On Liberty, right? That if, unless you hear the other arguments, you don't really test your own. But so what, but now I am more alarmed, I've got to say, having tried to talk to a fair number of students over the last six months or a year. And so what happened? I mean, the faculty didn't change that radically, presumably. Uh, uh, administrators, did the stu is it really a student-led thing? I, uh, no, I'd, say, I'd, say two th I'd say two things. One, um, to take a group that you know better than I and a group that on 97% of all questions I disagree with, uh, the Federalist Society. The Federalist Society's probably been the most successful effort to nurture within academic communities a set of ideas. And it's based in law schools. Based in law know, schools yeah. that dr has driven a whole set of conservative jurisprudence, almost right. all of which I want to be absolutely clear, <laughs> right, I oppose right. the conclusions. But it always impressed me that they were always willing to invite any progressive who would come to come and denounce what they had to say. Over the years, I've attended a number of uh, their events and you know, argued in very vigorous ways for more active approaches to economic regulation or right. more progressive taxation than they favored. But they always wanted to have the debate. Right. And that, it seems to me, is something that many on the more numerous left side of the spectrum uh, in universities have been too reluctant to do and too quick to dismiss those they disagree with as irresponsible or uh, not worthy of uh, being, uh, not worthy of being heard. I think that it's gotten uh, worse for a combination of reasons, I would guess. Uh, what happened in Ferguson, Missouri and in some other places has been jarring with respect to the national psyche. I think there's a kind of intellectual contagion across college campuses. And when this starts in one place, right. it has a tendency uh, to spread. I think the weakness of the weakness of administrators who have often had as their dominant instinct to placate rather than to educate has emboldened uh, those who see their moment uh, to establish uh, a kind of uh, Orth, uh, a kind of orthodoxy. Um, and I think uh, that uh, there may be an element uh, in uh, this generation's uh, just come to feel uh, that there's a set of narrower range of what's acceptable. Look, you, you have to um, recognize that uh, social norms are, can be a good thing, right. and at the same time, shutting down debate can be a bad thing, and there's a line. Um, the set of things, the set of ways in which 
a homosexual can be described in socially acceptable terms is completely different than it was when you and I were in college. And that is a mark of progress for us as a society towards being a more tolerant and just society. And the other side of that right. is going to be that sometimes it's going to go too far and that it's going to have the effect of uh, cutting off or uh, limiting uh, de or or limiting uh, debate, and that's a balance that has to be uh, uh, that has to be struck. Uh, you know, I, I think it's a mistake to be um, an absolutist on these things. I mean, take a somewhat broader question that implicates education, Bill, that goes beyond universities. Um, the fact that we had a national summit in the White House on bullying. How should one think about that? On the one hand, one can say, oh, come on. Uh, kids will be kids will be kids. Kids have to work out their own pro their their own problems. On the other hand, there's been a lot of cruelty. Right. And you know, many people have died by their own hand because of the shame and the difficulty they've had in encountering bullying. So perhaps it is a sign of our greater humanity as a society that we're now able to define bullying as a problem. So I think one makes a mistake in just trying to laugh off the concerns that lead to uh, political correctness. At the same time, I think there are some very real excesses, and certainly I think that the excesses of administration rhetoric at many universities uh, have been a real problem. I, I think this is a case, to say one thing, I think this is a case actually where satire and ridicule have been effective. Yeah. And I think the uh, efforts of a number of Harvard students to mock the placemats yeah. uh, were in a way more effective than thoughtful critiques of, of uh, political, political correctness. And I've actually been gratified that on most of the campuses where these things that seem quite odd to me uh, have taken place, there have been student movements of protest and student movements uh, of concern that have risen up. So my guess is we'll find our way back uh, towards uh, some equilibrium. But I think it is uh, the responsibility and a responsibility that's not fully being met uh, of academic leaders um, to address these issues. Yeah, what was striking from outside was that the protests, as you said, were at Harvard and Yale and Princeton, not exactly hotbeds of, you know, right-wing sentiment or, or even of uh, people really, I mean, the, and the people who they went after, this poor housemaster and I guess his co-housemaster, I guess that's a term that we're not going to use much longer, but anyway, head of the house or whatever it's what supposed to say, at Yale, who are liberals, I mean, as, as that pathetic kind of YouTube where he's trying to say, I'm, I'm with you, I've been a liberal all my life, you know, I've devoted my life to helping liberal causes. I mean, that's what's sort of striking from the outside. It's one thing, I think we can argue about, you know, Ferguson, Missouri, but like that's a real issue of police departments and minorities and how to do policing. Those are real public policy issues. What seemed so crazy from the outside about some of the stuff in the colleges and universities Look, there are was that it was just, there are morally was, serious things happening. There are people being there are people being slaughtered. There are people who aren't safe on streets right. who should be protected. To regard it as one of life's premier moral injustices to have to eat dinner underneath the portrait of Woodrow Wilson yeah, that's, is to lose perspective right. on what is happening uh, in uh, the world. And I think it's the job of adults uh, to provide 
uh, some uh, pers some perspective uh, on uh, that, but it's very important not to recognize that this isn't part of something that has a lot of. It it's not that there's no merit in the kinds of concerns that are being expressed. In some ways, it's like, uh, you know, I've, I showed my students uh, a little bit of uh, photography and video of what happened at Harvard in the late 1960s when, you know, there was offices that were, came close to being burned and when uh, administrators were I think it's fair to say forcibly physically removed from uh, their offices. And, you know, students today were shocked that something like that could have happened. And it was an appalling time, and what was done was appalling. But it wasn't that the Vietnam War wasn't right. a grave mistake. And I think that that kind of perspective is a useful perspective uh, to have uh, in uh, viewing uh, all of this. But I don't think we're going to get to the bottom of understanding the huge sets of social problems that we have in our country if we're not able to engage in open and free factual inquiry with debate um, and with uh, the recognition that there may be offensive policy recommendations, but there aren't offensive facts. Right. And that all facts should be matters of uh, open uh, Open and open and clear inquiry. No, and I think as you sort of suggested, the trivializing of what can be genuinely important causes is bad, actually, for those who want to advance those causes, because then it just looks to sort of people outside the university world and people who maybe aren't that sympathetic to some of these liberal causes in the first place. That well, this is all just crazy, you know, renaming schools and placemats and so forth. One last word about the present, then I want to go back to your own experience, since you've really been through this so much as. Yeah, the administrators do see, I mean, the students are students, they're 19 years old, I don't really blame them for too much. They should be punished, in my opinion, if they do things that are really beyond the bounds and they shouldn't be yielded to. But and the faculty seem to me to have not been terribly prominent one way or the other in most of these issues. What has been striking is the administrators, who I do think a generation ago would have not capitulated quite as quickly to what are, in many cases, just ridiculous demands and, 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 and aspersions on their campuses they've been running. I mean, if there's real, you know, if Princeton is a racist place, you think the president of Princeton would think, gee, I mean, I've been president of Princeton for a while. Maybe I, I can't just sort of accept this, this argument, and it's a slander also on all the people at Princeton. I mean, I, I am a little startled by the administrators' unwillingness to defend their, what you would think would be their own institutions, their own places they've been for their whole lives and so forth. Maybe the administrators seem to me to be different I mean, from I what think, they once were, I don't know. You know, I, I, I think it's hard to know in, uh, histor in uh, historical uh, perspective. I personally had strong feelings about this. The, uh, just before I became president of Harvard, the president's office was occupied for two weeks. Um, over the issue of the wages that Harvard paid its workers. And the students left after two weeks with a number of concessions having been made and with the administrators who occupied those offices clapping for the students as they left, who in many cases had been fed through the windows with milk and cookies by members of the university administration with total amnesty for all. And I have to say that I thought it was appalling. And I made clear um, with the support of the Harvard overseers and corporation, basically the trustees of the institution, that we had a code with respect to rights and responsibilities. And if 
offices were occupied after warning were given and people remained in those offices, there would be uh, disciplinary uh, consequences. I'm not sure, Bill, that you're quite as right uh, to entirely exempt the faculty. I'm happy, I think not, that, to. I'm happy not to. <laughs> I think that one of the issues is that the tradition and the custom in universities is that dis student discipline is a faculty matter. And I think one of the challenges for administrators is that they can't rely on the faculty mm. to carry through on discipline, even in fairly egregious cases like the physical occupation of offices. And that then affects uh, the amount of leverage uh, that uh, Administ uh, that administrators uh, have. And so I think there is a, uh, I think a lot of this does go back to um, a faculty oh, a who point. tend, who tend very much, particularly the faculty who take the greatest interest in university affairs, who tend very much to be sympathetic uh, to uh, protest movements of uh, one kind or another. I mean, I think, maybe I'm wrong about this, we, we said this at the time in the Weekly Standard, that when the assaults on you at, at Harvard were somewhat successful in the sense that they did succeed in uh, unfairly attacking you, and, uh, and then you left as president in 2006, um, I thought that was a very bad moment. So I do think it sent a signal that, and it was bad for Harvard in my opinion, because you were a good president, I thought, and, uh, but also it sent a signal that these kinds of misrepresenting what someone says or, or mischaracterizing his actions um, can work. And it, I think administrators sense, I don't think it's entirely an accident. This is the most prominent university in the country. Maybe not an accident that the administrators have decided that capitulating quickly and trying to just smooth everything over and hiring you know, six more assistant deans for student life and make sure everyone doesn't get upset about anything as opposed to defending some faculty member who's being Look, attacked. Look, I'm not. I don't want you to, I'm, you know, you're not going to. I surely made, I surely, I surely made mistakes. I'm surely not no, an I'm objective not. observer, an objective observer of uh, that, uh, of that, of that time. I do think that um, trustees of uh, universities have an important obligation not to overprivilege um, comfort and harmony. Yeah. And there is a tendency on uh, the part of trustees who are not themselves of university uh, communities who care deeply about universities to value harmony and happiness over what may sometimes be uh, necessary, which is a uh, painful, uh, painful argument and often uh, change uh, that is uh, disturbing uh, to many. I think American higher education is the envy of the world but if it has a flaw, it is that it changes and evolves uh, too slowly. That because of traditions of faculty governance, it has the dynamism or lack of dynamism that economists traditionally uh, establish or attribute to workers' uh, collectives. And uh, you know, why should it be that in uh, 35 years, in 35 years, there was not a single change in the departmental structure of the Faculty of Arts and Sciences at Harvard University? Could one imagine uh, such a thing in almost any other major institution uh, in uh, society? And so I think that this um, privileging of uh, comfort is a threat to 
the ability to keep up with uh, the demands of a rapidly uh, a rapidly changing uh, society. And I guess it also, yeah, it, it both makes the universities more conservative with a little c, and also less willing to presumably take risks. And uh, you yeah, I was surprised uh, when I gave uh, my inaugural speech at Harvard. I had towards the after I laid out an agenda of a number of issues that I wanted to work on, I had a when paragraph. Two thousand two thousand and one. One. I had a I had a paragraph um, in which I. I thought of it as, I didn't think of the language as empty, but I frankly didn't think of it as being all that substantive a paragraph in which I said, uh, we will take great risks. We will sometimes fail. Indeed, if we never fail, that would be the greatest failure of all because it meant that we had not taken enough risks mm -hmm. to meet the great challenges of our time. And I was surprised by the number of people who felt that... Why should we plan to fail? Yeah, that's interesting. And it reflected a kind of mindset that I think um, was, um, was, was unfortunate. You know, looking at universities, there's, there's a set of issues, and I, I'm never sure quite where to come down on, but I'm pretty sure we're not in the right place. The median age of the Harvard professoriate, those who are tenured professors is only slightly younger than I am, and I am 61. And that seems wildly inappropriate. And if you compare it with almost any other human institution, any great law firm, any great management team of any great company, the physicians at any great uh, hospi uh, hospital, um, even the senior officials of uh, the U.S. Uh, government, um, it looks uh, very old. And then you ask yourself, what is it that's special about a university? Well, the key job of a faculty member is working with people between the ages of 18 and 25. Right. And the other key responsibility is to have bold new ideas. And so you would think, if anything, there probably are arguments for university faculties being younger than other institutions, not substantially older. And so I think that lifetime security, that tendency towards an aged faculty, you know, Harvard has um, more professors over the age of 80 than it does under the age of 40, um, seems uh, to me to be something that is, uh, quite damaging uh, in terms of the ability of universities to keep up. Yeah, that's interesting. And some of that's due to a fluke, I suppose, and an interpretation of federal law that you don't have mandatory, you can't have mandatory retirement. Some of it is the that, you know, the, and... the universities um, have not protested very much. No. But the elimination of mandatory retirement, and I would say there's been a minimum of innovation yeah. in seeking to uh, find ways of contracting right. that would avoid um, the mandatory retirement. And even the extent to which there are things you can do, they're often not done. I mean, for example, you may have tenure as a professor. You don't have tenure in your 3,500 feet of laboratory space. Uh, in the biology department. Or to teach and in certain classes. You don't have the right. privilege of teaching. You right. don't necessarily have the privilege of being centrally involved in choosing the next generation. Yeah. And so I think that that is a serious threat uh, to, um, to, in general, it's all part of a phenomenon of the excess seeking of, of uh, comfort. comfort, you know, an issue that I was concerned by and I made progress on one aspect but not on another um, was the whole question of uh, grade and honors. Yes, uh, I remember you took that on. Honors <laughs> inflation. At the time when I became uh, president, it was close to being true that the most unique way in which you could graduate was without honors. 
<laughs> um, nearly 90% of the students graduated uh, with honors. Wow. We were successful in reducing that to a little bit above 50%. I think that's not a small thing, but we as an institution should stand, it seems to me, above all for intellectual excellence. And when 30% of the students in the typical class are getting A's, and A is the most common grade, then the student who is the best student in a class of 60 people is really very different in all likelihood than the student who is the 19th best in a class yeah. of 60 people. And when we give the same grade and don't recognize it, but it's part of a desire for everyone to feel comfortable. And it's that universal desire for comfort that I'm not sure does a great job of preparing people uh, for uh, the world and I think sometimes can interfere uh, with other absolutely crucial values in terms of the search for truth. Yeah, it's funny we're talking about this, and I, I think from the outside, people who don't follow the internal governance of universities much and don't, haven't thought as much about the complacency, maybe to some degree sclerosis of universities that you were trying to deal with. Um, you know, people remember you're taking on the BDS movement, the, the anti-Israel boycott movement, uh, trying to get ROTC back on campus, other more politically charged issues. I'm just, I want to talk about those, but I'm curious just to begin, which actually caused more, which caused more trouble for you at Harvard, do you believe? Was it these sort of politically hot button issues that, that you did speak out about and certainly were entitled to, it seems to me, as a university professor and president and took a, tried to take appropriate action on it in one or two cases? Uh, or was it the actual shaking up of the university itself and its internal governance and norms in terms of, I mean, it was- I'm it? not sure I can compare. I think it was, I think it was both. I think that in retrospect, um, I chose to take on a large number of issues <laughs> that involved running through goodwill. And someone who had been perhaps wiser or certainly who had been uh, committed to being in place uh, longer uh, would have been more selective with respect to the battles that were taken on. And I think you can debate the, they all seemed very important to me. Uh, great inflation seemed very important to me. The general culture question of the culture of comfort seemed very important uh, to me questions like uh, the university's estrangement from people who wear uniforms seemed uh, very important uh, uh, to, uh, to me. And I think the collectivity in a community that was uh, committed uh, to a certain way of doing things and a community that did not lack for self-regard and thought of its president more as a cheerleader than as a social critic um, led to the very substantial tensions uh, that I had with members of the faculty. On the other hand, I look back and take great satisfaction from the really quite substantial changes, whether it was in making Harvard universally accessible and seen to be universally accessible to people, families with low incomes, or the huge expansion we mounted and the commitment to uh, the life sciences or the substantial increase in the amount of faculty contact uh, that there was uh, with uh, undergraduates or the, what was an important internal issue, the extent to which there was uh, interaction between the different schools, for example, for the first time the university uh, came to have a common uh, calendar. Uh, I look back at all of that and I think a great deal happened that was important and while 
certainly I didn't enjoy and my family enjoyed even less <laughs> the uh, degree of controversy that surrounded it all. I think a great deal of it was worth accepting controversy for because I think what universities and what Harvard does in terms of education and research is hugely important and uh, it was able to do them in different ways as a controversy, a consequence of some of the controversies we had during that time. Talk, talk, talk about the controversy over BDS, which you, the boycott movement of Israel, which you, I think, correctly said was uniquely targeted on Israel of all the nations in the world. This is the one that the universities were being asked to uh, divest themselves Look, this of. Is a, this is a continuing issue today. There was a movement during the time I was president on the part of members of the faculty uh, to ask the university to divest uh, any stock, that any company that invested in Israel. And it seems to me there are a set of general arguments why universities should not use their endowment right. in political ways. But it seemed to me that quite apart from those general arguments, the idea that Israel should be singled out as a human rights uh, abuser was morally uh, insensate. Um, it seemed to me that there wasn't much question that if an African country was singled out for censure and there was no clear grounds for why that African country was worse um, or different than a number of European or Asian countries, I had no doubt that it would be seen in many quarters as racist. And so I chose words that were carefully selected. I said that uh, the proposals, if they were implemented, would be anti-Semitic in their effect, even if not, because I believe the people who proposed them were well-intentioned if misguided, even if not anti-Semitic in their intent. So I said anti-Semitic in effect, uh, if not intent. And it generated substantial controversy. I think, and I'll admit that this was part of my effect, part of my objective. Right. I think many people who hadn't thought about it that carefully and who had a general kind of progressive sense of alienation from the peace process probably just didn't want to contemplate the possibility that they were near anti-Semitism and decided not to push the issue as hard as they might otherwise yeah. have in the face of what I had said. And certainly a number of uh, students who, if they'd had the word, if they'd had the current vocabulary, would have felt they'd been the victim of microaggressions in the form of uh, feeling identified with Israel and having Israel attacked, thanked me very much for what I had said and done. And for a number of years afterwards, the Divest Israel movement um, was relatively quiescent. It's been back in force in recent years. The American Studies Association, the American Anthropological Association, a variety of academic associations have announced their intention to boycott um, uh, Israeli scholars or to boycott interaction with uh, Israeli uh, universities. And I think it's deplorable. Uh, my wife, and it matters, uh, my wife, uh, visited a uh, prominent Israeli university last winter, and the person who introduced her spoke about how much this meant, that you know, she had come from a peace rally. The, the set of people that Lisa was speaking to were anything but supporters of Bibi Netanyahu, and yet they felt so stung by the idea that they studied America and that scholars in American studies wouldn't come and participate in their colloquia, that it had an enormous impact. And 
I've been disappointed by the response of university presidents. It's true that they've not welcomed this development, but they've framed the argument almost entirely in terms of their distaste for academic boycotts right. rather than anything about the specific substance. And I'm not sure that boycotting Hitler's universities actually would have been such a terrible thing. Right. And so it seems to me that it's a inappropriateness in recognizing what's going on in Israeli universities and with Israeli scholars and with singling out Israel that's to be condemned. And that hasn't been a position that uh, American academic leaders, uh, at least the ones who are sitting, uh, sitting in office, uh, have been willing to take. And in a number of, ca in a number of cases, uh, including Harvard, uh, universities have maintained their institutional memberships in organizations like American Studies that uh, boycott uh, Israel. And I, I have to say, I find that deplorable. Yeah, it's really stunning. I mean, I remember when the whole movement began. I just thought it was so ludicrous because whatever you think of the Israeli government, the settlements, all that stuff, um, if you came down from Mars and looked at the different countries in that region, you would say that there was quite a lot more academic freedom, decent treatment of minorities, uh, democratic mores, et cetera, democratic elections, you know, freedom of speech in a country like Israel than in many of, their, of the neighboring countries. And the idea that that one of all would be selected for boycott, and it's pretty serious. I think, you're, I think you make a very good point that I, I think I myself was sort of underestimated. The economic side of it always seemed kind of ridiculous, and it's pretty easy for people running endowments to say, we can't get in that business because that's a crazy way to run, you know, uh, to manage money. We have a fiduciary responsibility. But the actual boycotting, I've talked to Israeli academics, the sense that they are pariahs and that, and, and the pressure then internally, as you say, on faculty members elsewhere not to go to Israel or even to invite an Israeli scholar to give a talk, I suppose, here in the U.S. or at, the, at their university. It's a little shocking when you think about it. You're a professor at Hebrew University. You're probably some dovish, you know, anti-BB, Netanyahu voter. And you, and I guess the position of the boycotters is that person shouldn't be invited to... It varies. Sometimes it's that person. Sometimes it's or that... The institution. Insti they shouldn't partner with that person's right. institution. It varies from but, boycott to boycott. But the general direction seems to me misconceived. And as a practical matter, and this is outside my area of most expertise, but uh, as a practical matter, it seems to me a very poorly calculated strategy for bringing about right. what is desired because it seems to me that an Israel that feels more secure rather than an Israel that feels more pressured is an Israel that's likely to walk more steps uh, for peace. And an Israel that doesn't think the United States has its back, that doesn't think it can rely on uh, the uh, United States is, it seems to me, an Israel that's much less likely uh, to be constructive as constructiveness is seen um, by those who um, would have Israel take more steps to uh, withdraw. So it seems to me that it's from a position of uh, more commitment rather than more condemnation that we have a better chance of encouraging the kind of two-state solution that, uh, that those who are most committed to this movement think is most important, except for those, and I don't think there are most of them, but there's certainly some uh, within the BDS uh, movement whose real goal is to entirely delegitimize right. Israel. Uh, as a state, but for those who have a constructive vision, and there are many, I, I don't. I think it. I think the political analysis, even if one leaves aside the moral and the truth-seeking aspects, is quite problematic. And ROTC was sort of a similar situation, I think, where you took a step back and said, "Well, we, 30 years ago, there might have been a reason to Vietnam to." I didn't kick think, I didn't see off I don't campus. Think, Maybe there wasn't, but anyway, I don't it, think it was, was a relic a, of that I time. I don't think. 
I don't see how one can be a responsible citizen and deny the obligation as a citizen to be part of respecting the democratically elected, repeatedly made decisions about the defense of the country. So I personally, from the time the issue first emerged, uh, at least on my consciousness in the early 90s, was didn't like the don't ask, don't tell policy and favored the policies we have uh, now, which are like those in uh, most other countries. But it seems to me when you have decisions taken by multiple commanders in chief of both parties, supported by congressional, bipartisan congressional votes in both houses of both parties, implemented by the military in response to democratic control, that the idea that universities are simply going to say, we're not going to cooperate with this institution like it was a law firm that ran wet t-shirt contests, right. seems to me to misunderstand and to miseducate on the nature of obligation uh, within a democracy. And so I found it uh, profoundly uh, offensive and, and said so. I indeed was at the point, I didn't, I was able to bring Harvard and ROTC closer together right. in a number of ways, but I didn't actually bring ROTC back on uh, the campus. But, you know, it was revealing to me that when I arrived, um, I was told that students who were in ROTC could not list their service in ROTC in the university yearbook because only university recognized activities could be listed in the yearbook and ROTC couldn't be recognized as a university activity because it was it was excessively exclusion it was excessively exclusionary because of the military's discriminatory practice, but they could uh, issue, they could list themselves as part of an organization of friends of Harvard ROTC, because friends of Harvard ROTC could. And I said, would you allow there to be an organization which was friends of the Ku Klux Klan that was prepared to right. admit anybody? And uh, eventually we succeeded in having good sense prevail. And, um, uh, allow those students to list themselves in the yearbook. And I was proud to be the first Ivy League president in 30 years to attend an Ivy League commissioning ceremony, an ROTC commissioning ceremony, and I attended each of them during uh, my time as uh, president. But I do think it was a case where we had lost our way. And fortunately, um, because the gaze in the military issue has been resolved, uh, we now have at least some degree of uh, collaboration uh, with uh, ROTC. But I still think there's a serious issue of uh, the degree of estrangement uh, between uh, people who wear uh, uniforms and people who are in uh, academic communities. Uh, we, we listen to university president speeches about public service. Public service is always a value that's being extolled on universities. I was always careful when I spoke about public service to include military service as an example of public service. That is very much the exception. and. Uh, I don't see how one can. I, I have not served in. The, I have not served in the military, but I don't understand how one can regard um, working in a school as it's not morally inferior, but I don't think it's morally superior to being involved in. Uh, the direct uh, 
defense of freedom. And it seems to me it's very important uh, to uh, recognize that. And I think on that issue, you prevailed. I mean, most, let us to say, you didn't, uh, I mean, your successor mostly continued, I think, your practice. I think. Attended. Before, well, I think, before she, Don't Ask, well, Don't Tell ended and she actually put our agency back on campus. I think, I think that, I think in that, the, I think there was a continuing I impact. You, you, I think it was a continuing, continuing impact there. I think that's right. I think that's yeah. probably right. Yeah, which is good. But I mean, it does show that university presidents can exercise moral leadership and political leadership somewhat against the grain of their institutions, maybe most usefully against the grain of their institutions. What's the point of having someone, I mean, if, you know, if you just say what everyone agrees with at your institution, you're just, as you say, a, so, well, as you said earlier, kind of a cheerleader for the institution as opposed to challenging. Yeah, and look, challenging not a, and look I, I, I think it's, you know, I think it's, and I think it's a mistake. Look, I, I want to also say, I think it's a mistake, uh, Bill, to, to treat all of this as just being right and left and no, left is wrong. You know, one of the things that I was proud to have done was uh, when uh, the Bush administration made what I thought was a substantial error uh, very early on in the way in which it curbed federal support for stem cell research. Um, we committed a very substantial volume of funds to supporting stem cell research because we believed that it, was, it could be done in ways that were morally acceptable and that there was very substantial potential to contribute to life saving. And uh, we established a substantial stem cell center with university resources that took the place of the federal resources that we thought should have been available. And that's another case where ultimately uh, things went our way. And, but I, but I want to emphasize that uh, not everything that's controversial and involves politics is taking the right side of things yeah. as distinct from taking uh, the left side of things. I thought it was very important when, when, when I became president that only a quite small fraction of uh, Harvard students had international experiences or studied abroad. We were, I think, the lowest in American higher education, rivaled only by West Point and Annapolis. And I felt that kind of attitude reduce the level of international understanding. And we were able over time to very substantially uh, increase the extent of the university's international connections uh, for uh, students. So I want to emphasize that uh, while there are and some of the things that were more controversial on the campus did have a right-left uh, aspect, there was nothing right wing about the idea that if your family's income's under $40,000, you shouldn't have to pay no. to come to Harvard. And a set of these other things like the stem, like the stem cells, like the uh, emphasis on international experience and understanding. Oh, and from my point of view, one of the great things about America is it's a free country and it's got hugely uh, important private institutions which don't work for the federal government and are free to sponsor research that the federal government in a particular administration chooses not to sponsor or and is free to pursue their own paths. I, one of the distressing things from the outside about higher education in a way is that there's not as much real d diversity as you think there might be. That is, you'd think we're going to have 3,000 universities, but let's just say 100 or 200 prestigious, you know, more academic universities in the country. Maybe that's even too low, three, 400, I don't know. They should sort of look more different from each other, don't you think? This is a broader question. I, I do think someone who came down from Mars and looked at the you know, to say, why, why do they all look so similar? I mean, surely it can't have been inscribed on tablets that there should be a four-year undergraduate education and the following department should exist everywhere and there should be the following tenure rules everywhere. You'd think it would be healthier just to have, I, I don't mean diversity in the fancy political sense, I just mean in the common commonplace sense. You know, there are sort of, there are fancy upscale French restaurants and there are cheap pizza parlors and there are chains and there are mom and pop places and somehow that's what we think a free society looks like and then in higher ed it just strikes me the uniformity is probably can't be healthy just for finding out what works and for challenging the status quo you try to do a little bit of that at Harvard obviously but I think that's I, I think that's a fair fair comment and I think it'd be a worthwhile it'd be worthwhile to try to understand that I, I'm not certain how much of that reflects the University's universal desire to imitate each other 
and how much reflects the demands of a society. Uh, right. The legal profession maintains what, to my mind, are far excessive right. set of common requirements to be a lawyer. And then we observe that there's a certain similarity between right. all law right. schools. Um, employers look for a certain kind of thing in a college, in a college degree. And uh, so I think that that, I think there is a question uh, around that. I think it's also a feature of um, education that you only get you only get your college education once. Right. So no one wants and to so take great risks. It's, so right? it's much easier to encourage experimentation with toothpaste. Where if you don't like the toothpaste, right. you can go back to the to the new toothpaste. So some of the some of the things I think are structural. Um, in those, uh, right. in, uh, in that dimension. But I think that's right. And I think that in many ways, the challenge for American education is to be more like us. Because if you look around the world, I think you'd say, here's what I think you'd say. I think you'd say that America does extremely well in higher education. That, you know, of the top 100 institutions in the world, more than half are American and you wouldn't find that in so many spheres. And I think you'd say that because in the rest of the world, there's a tendency for universities to either be run like the Department of Motor Vehicles, uh, right. thick salaries for everybody, detailed state prescriptions as to curriculums, right. or, and this also happens in many places, really run like a kibbutz. Uh, the president's elected for a three-year term by all the faculty and staff, uh, which creates overwhelming pressure on the president to do what the faculty and staff want to get another three-year term, or if that's not feasible, the president's only there for three years and there's a limit to how much they can do. Mm. And so American universities actually stand out in the extent to which they're internally governed rather than externally governed, and the extent to which they're able to, but internally governed from the outside with the Board of Trustees, um, and the extent to which they compete with each other. And yes, I agree with you that if they, those elements were even strengthened, they would probably be even stronger institutions uh, than they are. Do you think they'll pretty much look the same 10, 20, 30 years from now? You've been involved somewhat in the online courses and some efforts, and this itself is a kind of way of trying to educate students or give them a taste of some topics and introduce them to thinkers and figures uh, sort of outside the conventional classroom or university. But um, my guess is that the leading institutions will look broadly as they do, but that we will see a set of substantial changes in uh, what happens in higher education uh, broadly. I think that for many, many people, education will become an increasingly lifelong pursuit rather than something that's confined to four years. My fear is that because they'll be too tied to doing it in their traditional ways that uh, as often happens when an industry is disrupted with new technology, it will be new entrants rather than the existing entrants that will lead in like using the internet to provide lifetime uh, education. But I hope, I'm, I hope that I'm wrong uh, in that judgment. I think there will be more and more development of um, skills-based certification right. where people learn 
certain aspects of material and are then deemed by employers to be qualified to do certain things. And some of that will take place in four-year residential institutions, but two-year residential institutions, but much of it will take place outside of uh, residential institutions. So I would be surprised if uh, higher education doesn't change more over the next 40 years than it has over the last uh, 40 years. But I think I would also be surprised just given that the basic form of universities has been around for a very, very right. long time if you didn't still have a group of extraordinarily talented 18-year-olds gathering together in September of each year um, at a set of institutions preparing to be educated over the next four years. And on the whole, you think, obviously, I take it, you think that's a good thing. I mean, how worried should one be? And I'm ambivalent about this myself. There is sort of a critique, I think from the left and right, you might say, of the sorting process that, you know, you say it in a nice way, a talented 18-year-olds having a wonderful four years, and it is a wonderful year in many ways at Harvard or many other colleges and universities. On the other hand, from a certain point of view, you can say this is just accentuating inequality, the, the smartest kids are meeting other smart kids and marrying them, which is great, but on the other hand, in a certain way, it's, uh, it's uh, creating more of a bubble, and they're going to Goldman, to, to, and they're going from Harvard to Yale Law School to Goldman Sachs or whatever, and the kind of concerns that people on the right, people on the left have raised, I mean, Charles Murray, Bob Putnam, of sort of, uh, are we inadvertently really creating in a meritocratic way, so it's not like old, you know, 19th century, perhaps, uh, you know, legacies, but are we inadvertently creating, I don't know, two tracks almost in the society? How much are you certainly tried, very, worked hard to, uh, I to create big, more opportunity I think it's, for I think poor kids big, to come to Harvard, but how issue. much do you that's think it's a I problem? Put, that's why I put so much emphasis, not just on creating opportunity, but on recruiting uh, the kids, on looking in a holistic way at people's background and recognizing that if you're privileged to come from the kind of family I came from or the kind of family you came from, right. uh, that a certain level of academic performance may be suggested less than if you came from, if you got that same level of academic performance and you came from a family with much less, uh, a, a much less advantage. I don't, I don't think we have devoted the effort to addressing issues of class that we have to issues of race. Right. And I think that's a hugely important challenge going forward. I think there's an issue which I also tried to push, not with not over my horizon, uh, with success, which goes to the scale of these institutions. And there's a tendency, you know, if you thought about an institution as successful as Yale or as Princeton or as Har or as Harvard and you looked at how rapidly it grew since 1970, it would grow in the private sector right. vastly faster. Um, but these institutions have a bit of the aspect of an exclusive club. Right, and growing so they too don't, much would damage their so they don't so, right. they don't so they don't grow, and I think that's something that needs to be thought about. I think in terms of meeting their responsibilities, right. a greater commitment uh, to uh, growth would be appropriate. Perhaps the use of technology and will lead to uh, more. Will will lead to more of that. I think there's a question: what the right degree of involvement is w of leading universities with the question of K through 12 education uh, in the country in an earlier era. The university system had a great deal to do with the establishment of college board tests, AP tests. Those institutions are more flawed today, but in their day, they were major engines of opportunity right. and major stimuli to improvement. Well, just what the right ways are is a very hard question, but it seems to me that universities could be doing more than they are 
to support the development of K through 12 uh, education uh, in uh, the country. But yes, I think it is, um, I think this question of cleavages is a uh, very, very, is a very, very real, uh, real, real issue uh, for the society. I mean, it does seem to be that if, well, cl uh, close on this maybe, but yeah, if you and Marty Feldstein teach an excellent, I don't know, American economic policy course here at Harvard, and look, the kids who get it to Harvard are great, and they deserve to have a very good course, and they deserve to have your personal attention, and good grad students as TAs and so forth. It wouldn't be crazy to say, but incidentally, at the same time, maybe Harvard should just make available that course online, at least the lectures. It wouldn't be as good. It wouldn't be like sitting there and having the personal access. But of course, one could also imagine ways you could get people access with online, you know, with, uh, you know, an hour or two with a grad student or with you or, or sending questions. But even so, something that would sort of let, I, I do, one has the feeling that there's an awful lot of excellent teaching that could be, that a lot of other people could benefit from in the, in the country and even in the world. I know you were involved a little bit in efforts to do my, this. My, Does my, it work? I mean, is it a reasonable I, thing to I'd think say about? These, I'd, I'd make these points. Uh, one, I'm broadly sympathetic to, to what you say. My vision for this, the vision that most of the leading universities have pursued has been a little different from that, has not actually been precisely in this direction, uh, has, was uh, to think about the concept of an extension school. Mm -hmm. We have an extension school right. at Harvard. It teaches courses at night. It doesn't have exclusive admissions. It's got a somewhat different faculty than the one that teaches during the day. It offers a different degree, but it offers a Harvard experience to um, residents of Boston, residents of Boston and Cambridge. Perhaps we should have a 21st century extension oh, school. Good. And it is via, mostly Harvard faculty. Via the, via, the, via the internet. And if we do it that way, we might be able to reach people on a huge scale. But that involves a rather different vision than the vision that we currently have, which emphasizes the synergy between our outreach and what's right. going on within our campus. But I think that notion of 21st century extension education uh, is a powerful one. I think it's a little more complicated than you suggest because uh, one of the clear learnings, even in these early days, is this. Um, at the beginning of movies, people thought the idea was that you'd go to a theater and you'd put a camera in the back of the room and that would be your movie. And they came fairly quickly to recognize that it really wasn't going to be that good to have theater without the immediacy. And that once you had the cameras, you had the potential to do all kinds of things that weren't possible in the theater. Right. And I think the same thing is true with respect to uh, video and that we make a mistake if we think that it's simply a matter of taking my course. No, fair my enough. wife has uh, produced a course on uh, American uh, poetry um, that reaches each year uh, five times as many students as she's taught in a classroom in her whole life. And it's very different, though, than just filming her classes. Right. And I think it will turn out to involve a somewhat different set of skills that the old sage on the stage may or may not be successful as a video architect for an educational experience. But I think that there is scope and you're seeing it in people all over the world have an occasion to learn basic physics or to right. uh, learn uh, this and I'm sure that this will move forward in some very important uh, directions. I hope you're right, and I think it'll move forward more quickly if American higher education has leaders with courage and a willingness to take risks, which you were when you were president of Harvard. And so I thank you for that, and I thank you for joining me today on Conversations. Thank you, Bill. Thanks, Larry. Thank you for joining us on Conversations.